thank you everyone very much for registering for this seminar. I'm Bob Toyofuko of Pacific Law Institute. We are at the halfway point in this 2024 session, and there's about 750 bills still on the table uh, out of over 2,600 that were introduced in January. So before I mention some preliminary matters and what will be covered this morning, let me introduce the speakers for this seminar. First, we have Senator Drew Mamokanua from the Big Island, who is the Senate Majority Leader. We also have Representative Nadine Nakamura from Kauai, who is the House Majority Leader. Senator Angus McKelvey from Maui is the Government Operations Committee Chair and we'll be talking in a little more detail about the Maui wildfire and recovery. And last, we have Representative Della Albalati from the House, who is the chair of the House Health and Homeless Committee, and will be focused on the homeless issues. Well, this morning, what we want to cover is the Maui wildfire with a brief overview with Senator uh, uh, Kanuha and Representative Nakamura, and then with Senator McKelvey getting into more detail. We also will touch on the economic concerns and the budget, affordable housing, education, a touch of crime, and uh, maybe some other issues depending upon the time that uh, we have. Uh, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we will answer as many as possible as time permits. If you need to use utilize captions, press the CC button at the bottom of your screen, and then press Request. Keep in mind that you can also access at later on the, the legislative website capital.hawaii.gov to look at any particular uh, bills that you are interested in. Lastly, uh, at the end of the seminar this morning, please fill out the questionnaire. Uh, we're trying to determine what kind of future programs in, in the legislative arena, arena uh, that will be of interest to you. Uh, we will begin with Senator Kanuha and Representative Nakamura, and Senator McKelvey and Representative Bellotti will be joining the seminar at a later time. Um, the Maui fire created many complicated issues, uh, and we wanna spend some time with the two majority leaders on what has passed so far in terms of issues, uh, but we have time devoted later on with Senator McKelvey being from uh, Maui to delve into more detail on some of the bills. So I'll start with Senator Kanuha, if he can go over very briefly, you know, what are some of the major substances, substance of the Maui wildfire bills? Senator? Uh Thank you, Bob, and good morning, everybody. I just want to say uh, mahalo for inviting me to participate uh, this morning. Um, also, hello to my colleagues on the call, uh, House Majority Leader and uh, House uh, Rep. Bilotti, and of course, my colleague in the Senate, uh, Senator McKelvey, uh, for being here as well. Uh, thank you for giving us the time to um, update all of you on a lot of these important issues that we're facing um, here in mid-session. Again, you know, I, I, I represent District 3 on Hawaii Island, um, Kona Ka'u and Volcano, and, and the Majority Leader of the Senate. So just kind of like a brief uh, overview of the, the, the fiscal impacts of the Maui wildfires. Obviously, we have our hearts out to um, everybody who has been impacted by this uh, devastating event on Maui, and, you know, including... Our, our colleague here on the call on the, the Zoom call, uh, Senator McKelvey, who has been uh, deeply impacted by what has happened. And um, but you know, basically, um, some of the fiscal overviews um, in the Senate. You know, I'm I'm also part of the Ways and Means Committee with Senator Donovan Dela Cruz, 
uh, vice chair, or as the chairman of uh, the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Vice Chair Maury Walkey, um, and also our other senator on um, the Ways and Means Committee, Senator Troy Hashimoto, has been kind of leading a lot of the, the Maui discussions in the Ways and Means Committee. Of course, uh, Senator McKelvey has been um, uh, uh, part of this discussion as well, uh, being fr being heavily impacted by the, the fires. But uh, they've been trying, they've been basically leading a lot of the Senate's efforts to stabilize the state budget uh, with regards to a lot of the costs that have been coming out from this disaster. Um, you know, we've been providing um, housing for the affected families that are not covered by FEMA, you know, basically FEMA ineligible, um, debris cleanup costs, and, you know, just a lot of the costs uh, and anticipating a lot of the potential liabilities that are going to come out of this. So this has been the, the biggest topics of discussion that we've been uh, dealing with um, lately. As many of you know, uh, prior to the convening of the legislative session, uh, Governor Green directed uh, funding into the major disaster fund, um, you know, close to $200 million. And um, the, the, the Green administration anticipated that this was the, this was sufficient to cover a lot of the state's costs to address the response recovery expenses for 2023-2024. Uh, um, however, as we've been diving deep into a lot of these um, uh, the revenue or the the discussions in ways and means, uh, the costs that have been incurred by the state are are pretty much expected to be to greatly exceed the amount originally uh, budgeted and thought of uh, by the governor. So, um, with many of the recent with many of the issues that uh, have ar arisen over the costs, um, what is eligible for reimbursement, and kind of a, a clear but unclear. A timeline by which the state will be reimbursed for eligible costs um, from the federal government. Um, the Senate proposed a few bills and that have been going through that we did send to the House. One of those bills was SB 582. Uh, this related to the state budget. It kind of it serves as a vehicle for um, the emergency disaster appropriation. Um, uh, so WAM uh, Senator De La Cruz is working diligently, um, Senate leadership uh, with the Green Administration, our congressional delegation, FEMA, uh, the county of Maui to uh, basically determine this fiscal need, um, which is um, going to be something that we've been dedicating a lot of time towards and making it a priority um, um, in the legislature. I know the, the House is as well. So um, hopefully, as constitutionally mandated to provide a balanced budget at the very end of session. So we'll see how these discussions um, happen over the course of the next uh, month or so uh, with the, the House and the governor. But um, that's kind of a basic breakdown of what we've been um, dealing with, um, trying to address um, the need for our people in Maui and, and, and the needs of the rest of the state and everything that uh, mm -hmm. We we have to take care of so that's that's an, a basic overview of uh, the the types of issues that we're dealing with um, with regards to helping the people of Maui. Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator Representative Nakamura. I, I, there were many bills that were companion bills, so to speak. So both the Senate and the House uh, uh, passed bills, and they crossed over uh, this a few days ago. And one bill, if you can just mention it very briefly, apparently both the House and Senate uh, want to have uh, the utilities uh, prepare a mitigation plan uh, by the a PUC. So can you touch on that just very briefly? Thank you again, Bob, for inviting uh, me to participate and to the um, Pacific Legal Foundation for um, for the invite, I wanted to, um, the bill that you're talking about, HB 2407, I believe, is uh, establishes this a process for all electric utilities to develop and submit wildfire prevention plans to the PUC. And so this, um, uh, there are different versions of this bill uh, that were introduced. I think the one that's moving forward includes 
um, a way to recover once they identify these are the things we need to do to mitigate future wildfires. It also includes um, a securitization component, which allows the utility to consolidate debt and then to um, have the cost of implementing the plan recovered by, I believe, either the ratepayers or the shareholders. I'm, it, I think it's, these things still need to be worked out. You know, I, I found it interesting when I was looking at the various wildfire bills, so to speak, uh, that there was there was a bill both in the House and Senate uh, requiring the University of Hawaii to uh, develop wildfire susceptibility maps. And I assume that both the House and Senate felt that this was important to have some kind of idea where wildfires in the future could erupt. Is that true? Yeah. Um, there's, you know, we have so many lands that are uh, in Hawaii that are not um, that are in conservation or preservation and that are susceptible to future wildfires. Um, so what this uh, does is give the University of Hawaii, I think it's UH, uh, the engineering department, working with the Water Resources Research Center and College of Tropical Agriculture to combine their skill sets and expertise to identify those priority areas where uh, there maybe there's a higher probability of wildfires and then to come up and then we can use this data and information to prioritize our resources our limited resources to looking at where we ought to be doing more work in forest management planting native um, and fire resistant resistant um, vegetation and then developing green belts so that we can create natural buffer areas to separate these wildlands from urban areas. You know, both uh, uh, Senator and Representative, reading uh, some of the media stories, I know that uh, in uh, West Oahu, the Waianae area, um, a concern, and same thing on Maui, is that in case there's a devastation fire like what happened in Lahaina, uh, I guess the legislature was also concerned in looking at trying to uh, determine uh, ex exit routes. And I know that was a problem. Uh, I don't know if there were any bills with regard to that, but I know that was an issue, especially on West of Oahu. The Waianae residents were very concerned about that too. Um, I believe there is a bill to. Um, oh, there is. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I went to the transportation committee and um, to look at um, uh, an alternative exit route for the Waianae Coast. Oh, thank you. Um, the other bill that you know I kind of looked at was uh, House Bill twenty seven hundred, Senate Bill three three four four, on the relief fund compensation for. Uh, property damage and so similar to uh, the one Ohana fund that is a um, a fund that the governor um, has proposed to and, and is actually has implemented to provide uh, relief for the victims of the wildfire uh, and and survivors who were injured. Uh, this is this would be a similar type of fund for property damage. And it would pool resources from the state, electric utility, the telecom companies, private landowners who, who would contribute to this relief fund to uh, cover future. So this wouldn't uh, deal with the Maui disaster specifically, but this would be a going forward um, uh, process to look at future claims because we know that with climate change, there will be more incidences of wildfires um, well, throughout our nation, but in Hawaii as well. So this is um, something that uh, uh, crossed over to the Senate. So um, Senator Kanuha, you'll be seeing it shortly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, there was a question that came up, I just looked, about uh, the bill numbers for the mitigation plan, and it is Senate Bill 2091. 
and House Bill 2407 that you can look it up on, on the website. Um, right after the fire, uh, Speaker Scott Psyche created uh, several, six, I believe, working groups to look at various aspects moving forward. And I think, and maybe uh, Representative Nakamura, you can talk about that. I think there were several bills that passed uh, with regard to the recommendations that were made by the working groups. Yeah, there's about uh, 10 bills and two resolutions that are part of the bipartisan wildfire package. Uh, and as you said, uh, Speaker Psyche set up the six groups uh, a few a month or so after the wildfires to really take a look at uh, how do we address some of the concerns and how do we um, plan for the future uh, based on what we learned um, from this experience. Uh, so while things are fresh in our minds, uh, we came up with uh, these bills and some resolutions. Um, and they're in uh, very different categories, uh, many uh, to deal with a funding for the Department of Land Nat and Natural Resources that um, really has been underfunded in the area of wildlife, wildfire emergency response. So they need um, some staffing, equipment, resources to, to do a better job and to do more preventive work on our state lands. Also, um, there are uh, bills relating to the air and water quality in Lahaina as all of this um, remediation is going on. We want to make sure that the air and water um, is safe for residents in this area. Uh, we want to make sure that we have better school evacuation plans in the future. Um, and then uh, we know that we can do a better job in terms of food supply and equipment uh, distribution. There were some breakdowns and um, so we know, uh, so one of the bills is to, you know, create the statewide plan to include stakeholders and in each of the counties and to really come up with a much more um, uh, responsive plan. And um, looking also at uh, how we can um, try to phase out or amortize um, short-term vacation rentals that, uh, as we are seeing in the case of Maui, uh, there are many of them, and it crowds out the, you know, the local marketplace. So we, um, there, there's a bill in play to to also address that. I know that's a very controversial issue. I was at a hearing on another issue, and there were a lot of uh, individuals that testified and organizations that testified on that uh, vacation rental issue. Yes. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Senator McKelvey is going to delve into more spe specificity on the wildfire bills. So I'd like to move uh, now to the economic uh, impact that is had and any kind of budget issues. And uh, first, you know, S Senator Kanua, they, there was a bill, you mentioned 582, uh, but there was also Senate Bill uh, 3068. Let's see, I want to make sure I got the, the right number. Yeah, Senate Bill 3068. And that pertained to the cost allocated at the cost associated with the wildfire. And I, I wonder if you could comment on it because when it came up for third reading, they were 20 senators, I think mostly Ways and Means, which you're on, that voted with reservation. And maybe you can explain uh, why that happened. Yeah, um, you're you're absolutely right. The 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 reason why we voted with reservations was because we didn't have a clear idea of how much everything was going to cost. Um, so it's it's hard to, you know, as, as legislators, you know, our vote every single vote matters, um, especially when you're explaining it to the general public, right, and to your constituents. So when you don't have an idea of the exact numbers and where it's going to go, you you kind of have a little bit of reservation about that vote. So I think um, it became incumbent, not incumbent, it, it became uh, uh, a way to, uh, for the, the, the Senate to say, 
you know, we do have some reservations about this. We want to do as much as possible to make sure that the the funding is there to help everybody that is in need. But if there's not if there's not a, a exact cost and identified uh, line item and everything that's going on with what's going on with what's happening, then it makes it very difficult to completely approve of the 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 vote that we're casting. So that's that's the basic of what happened with that those reservations. And you you saw the Senate, you know, trying to get answers and uh, about everything. It's it's very you know it's very dynamic issue. It, there's things going on that we don't really all completely know about. So that's that's that was a, the basic reason of why um, the votes with reservations. We wanted to keep the bill moving because we know that there's a desperate there's a there's a very a uh, dire need uh, to to help everybody involved, um, but uh, there there's going to be some reservations until we get a a complete idea of what's happening. You know, you know, Senator, it just so happens that I was watching that WAM hearing out of interest uh, because they had uh, the budget and finance director on as well as others, and I was. Uh, it was very informative that, you know, Senator De La Cruz was uh, uh, chairing the meeting. And my understanding is that initially uh, the legislature was told that maybe it was going to cost about $200 million for the Maui recovery through this fiscal year, which is June 30, 2024. And after listening to the, to the hearing, it looks like it's going to be $400 million. And, and you know, I, I maybe you, you both want to comment. I just uh, uh, all of a sudden it went from six hundred million over four years to a billion over five years, or something like that. Yeah, that it, um, you're you're absolutely right, and that's why we're we're trying to delve deep into what is being paid out, what we're obligated, what the state's obligations are, what the county is doing. Where are all the nonprofits at in helping? You know, how does that all come into play? Where's the FEMA reimbursements? Where where the state is paying out the the original payments and hoping that in the next several years we're going to get reimbursed by FEMA. Um, we don't know that that timeline. So this is all coming out of pocket right now, um, and we just want to get a better idea of what uh, the state's obligated to pay for. And who else is going to help pay for this? And you know, again, we're 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 trying to bring all this information out because we we want the public to know everything that's involved in all these decision making um, uh, efforts by the the legislature and the governor. So I think it's a it's a it's a good thing that we're diving deep into uh, the 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 pay the payments happening and. Obviously, we want our our people to be housed. We want the entire. We we need a lot more housing throughout the entire state. So we we we're trying to focus on not only helping Maui but everybody else in the state. So this is you know we're trying to do our obligated duty to make sure that our state is fiscally uh, sound and make sure that again, like I said earlier, we have a balanced budget at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Senator Representative Nakamura. Uh, you know your comments, and then I know finance. House Finance Committee just had budget hearings uh, on the general budget and the judiciary budget. So if you want to make any comments, uh, feel free to do so. Sure. I, I just want to agree with Senator Kanuha, um, Majority Leader Kanuha, who, um, that everything is still really in flux, that it's a, um, a dynamic process. We're finding out information. And I think even at the WEM meeting, the council members were finding out from the administrate council administration, uh, county administration, you know, what was happening. So there's just a, a lot going on. I'm not sure all of the answers we're going to get during this session. So we probably, you know, will need to be looking at uh, what, you know, what throughout this, this year and the next few years, uh, you know, what the costs are going to be and when the reimbursements are going to come in, because we have to, like uh, what Senator Kanu has said, is we're going to have to front some of the monies, a lot of the FEMA monies, and then we'll get reimbursed oh. over time. Uh, but yes, there were uh, many um, uh, tax-related bills uh, introduced this last um over the last few uh, weeks, and uh, that crossed over to the Senate. Uh, there were, uh, you know, the household and dependent uh, care services tax credit. 
there was the family caregiver tax credit that Kupuna Caucus introduced, a refundable child care uh, tax credit. Uh, many of these bills uh, is really designed to help our Alice families, asset limited, income uh, constrained, employed families um, in Hawaii. Um, and we know that um, child care and um, elderly care is a big portion of um, the household budget. So this is to assist in that area. Uh, there were also uh, tax-related bills uh, relating to amending income tax rates uh, that have not been adjusted for a while and then increasing the in, uh, standard deduction. Uh, so there are a lot of um, tax-related bills in play, but so much of it will be dependent on uh, the cost of Maui. And one thing that we didn't mention is that because the state is picking up the cost of uh, those who don't qualify for FEMA aid. So these might be um, uh, a, a undocumented immigrants and our COFA families that uh, that cost is, you know, was at the time a million dollars a day to the state. And that's why the need for transitional housing and permanent housing is gonna be important. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I learned from the hearing, and I think Senator alluded to it, is that FEMA federal is going to contribute to the Maui recovery. However, it is unclear how much they're going to do it and when. So I guess the issue for the state, maybe the counties as well, is that they have to front the cost and hopefully get reimbursed by the federal government. But I have another question, and and I never heard this at any hearing, but you know, just out there in the chatter, that uh, whether there might be a reduction in the budgets to the departments is that on the table, because it it affects other appropriations, I guess. Uh, I'll just comment briefly about that, uh, you know, because because as as uh, Majority Leader uh, Nakamura said earlier, you know, it's a very dynamic uh, uh, time right now with trying to figure out the the budget of the state and and dealing with uh, our you know this this unprecedented national disaster. Um, so we've we've asked uh, during Ways and Means Committee. I think it was uh, um, the chair of Ways and Means asked. The departments, when they provide a budget to you know to the committees, to look at possibly reducing ten to fifteen percent, um, giving us those options Ooh. because um, when we're looking at the 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 spiraling amount of money that the state has been spending on um, taking care of our our people on on Maui, you know we we just cautioned and ask that if this keeps on going the way it is, first, number one, um, how how does the state outlook look? You know, and, and the budget director said, you know, in, in July of 2025, we're gonna be out of money. So with, with those responses, uh, we, 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 we need to, again, constitutionally mandated to make sure that we have a balanced budget. So we've asked the departments uh, to send us um, uh, projection on a 10 or possibly 15% cut. And that's, that's, that's something that's not mandated by us. We just wanted to see what it would look like, what services every single department would have to reduce um, if we continue to uh, spend this much money. Yeah, thank you, Senator. I think almost everyone on this uh, webinar knows that you are required to have a balanced budget. And so, you know, it depends on how much money you have to to balance the budget, you know. But, you know, I have another quick question for both of you. Um, what is this going to do to grant in AIDS, GIAs? Um, because, you know, not-for-profits especially are really looking for this, but 
because of the tight situation in terms of funding, um, and I know you can't prevent it because you just don't know yet, but is there still the possibility that some monies will be allocated to granting aids, as far as you know? Yes. Hopefully. Yeah, I've talked to some other legislators, you know, and uh, involved either in finance or WAM and their concern. But, you know, I just wanted to raise that. It's, it's not an easy thing to uh, determine, but uh, I think for not-for-profits out there, I think they realize the, the uh, economic situation. So, you know, can't get your hopes up too high or say if you ask for X dollars, you, you may not get X. Even if you get 25% X, that's better than nothing. And lastly, uh, I know the Council of Revenues is going to come up with a uh, report shortly, but I have no idea what it's going to be. Probably you, you may not either, but I assume you're waiting for that uh, report to help uh, determine the budget in the future uh, for this year, the next couple of years. Yeah, um, I I believe it's going to be uh, they're meeting shortly and. Uh, you know, in January of this year, the Council of Revenue met and increased their uh, projections for growth in Hawaii for this year and next year. It was 4% and 4.5% for next year, which was very, um, gave us a lot of hope that the recovery was going smoothly. Uh, but in yesterday's Star Advertiser, the DBED came up with, DBDT came up with their projections of uh, much slower growth at 1.5% in 2024 and 2% in 2025. Mm. And that's going to really affect our um, our revenues and our ability to do all the things, as Senator Kanuha said, it, you know, throughout our, our state, not just the Maui wildfire, but all the other things and needs we have around the state. You know, I assume that... Uh... Because there's funds in the rainy day fund that the legislature can uh, access that to to help with the uh, uh, cash flow, right? It is a source of funds, and I think the reluctance is that um, the bigger the balance is in that rainy day fund, the better bond rating we will have, and the assurance that we can repay our debt over time. Um, helps in, in that regard. So we, uh, yes, it is raining <laughs> that we have access to those funds. Uh, so I think it's a balancing act. Thank you, uh, Representative. Um, there was one question that, you know, I'll leave, leave for uh, Senator McKelvey about able to access private donations on the, on the wildfire issue. So why don't we move? We have a few minutes left for, for both majority leaders. Uh, what's happening uh, either in the Senate and or House on affordable housing legislation? In the House, uh, you know, we have a couple of major approaches. One is uh, finan financing affordable housing, assisting housing developers through uh, the Rental Housing Revolving Fund and the dwelling unit revolving fund. So we have a bill out in our majority package to um, provide funding for the rental housing revolving fund. And what makes this bill different from others that have been introduced is that this a um, lot of the financing in the past has been for 60% and below AMI, so very low income families. But we know that working families are struggling to find rental housing throughout our state. So this is to provide a subsidy to our nonprofit, our state developers, our private developers who are building a, a, for this group between 60 and 120% of area median income to, um, so it's to, you know, pr provide additional funding to, to that fund. We also have sort of non-monetary bills this is to help uh, use our zoning codes to mm. 
more denser housing in our urban districts, the state urban districts. So um, we have a HB 1630 that um, uh, gives uh, homeowners the opportunity to build two additional dwelling, um, um, additional rental units on their single family lot. Uh, if, if the, you know, there's adequate infrastructure and uh, parking and so forth. Um, so it's just to promote more multi-generational housing in our urban districts that already have infrastructure. And then um, another bill to, um, uh, try to do more adaptive reuse and to encourage adaptive reuse of commercial buildings because we know there's a lot of vacant commercial buildings. So uh, making it, uh, giving the counties a couple of years to set up their rules to make adaptive reuse of these commercial structures um, um, allowable for uh, residential use. Oh, thank you, Representative. I know the Senate... Uh, has passed a couple of bills to, excuse me, one on affordable housing credits and uh, also on uh, inclusionary zoning. So, you know, both the House and Senate are looking at trying to uh, pass certain legislation to uh, encourage the building of more housing. And as, as we, it's a huge problem. But any comments, Senator, or we can move on? Yeah, yeah I'm, I mean, uh, 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 Rep. Dr. Mora is absolutely right. There's a lot of these are companions on the Senate that we've been hearing and yes. and advocating for. And I mean, I, I just briefly wanted to mention, including all the ones that uh, Rep. Nakamura spoke about. Um, uh, one of the bills that that the former one of the former uh, housing chairs on the House, uh, who now is Senator Hashimoto uh, as vice chair of the House, um, as vice chair of the Senate uh, Housing Committee. Uh, he, I just briefly uh, introduced SB 2133. Um, this basically um, authorizes HHFDC, Hawaii Housing and Finance Development Corporation, to issue bonds for infrastructure and, and to finance the development of regional state infrastructure projects. So, you know, typically offsite in infrastructure is a, kind of one of the main, uh, a big barrier to development of housing, typically paid for by, you know, the private developers. Who in turn, you know, pass a lot of those expenses off to um, home buyers and renters. So this 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 bill kind of, I mean, this bill does empower um, HHFDC to facilitate the development of the of the infrastructure needed to support new housing projects throughout the state. So that's one of the uh, one of the uh, few um, one bill that I just want to mention. Besides all the other ones that we've been trying to advocate for, um, both in the House and the Senate. Oh, thank you, Senator. Why, why don't we, we have a few minutes left for your segment. And so uh, why don't we talk about if you have anything to, you wanted to comment on, on education. And I know there were bills uh, pertaining to the Department of Ed, DOE, as well as the University of Hawaii. So if you have any brief comments, you know, we can do it at this moment. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that the House is uh, pursuing is uh, funding in the budget to help continue to grow access to high quality early learning opportunities through um, PK, pre K, uh, $19 million in the budget, and then for the preschool open doors program, $38.8 million. And that's, um, you know, we all know that, you know, having a real strong pre, pre K program is uh, is foundational and it um, will make a big impact to our students and our teachers if the students are learning at you know when they're three and four year olds they're learning they're um, they're socialized they're um, uh, know what it is to um, to be um, a good learner and so that's something we're really um, promoting. Uh, for three and four year olds, also work based learning. We have a majority package bill that helps to um, build more on the healthcare academies in our high schools because we know that half of our kids don't go on to college. They're looking for 
good jobs in, once they graduate. And so having a nice um, uh, learning the skills that they need to in high school. So when they graduate, they can go right into a hospital setting or a clinic setting. And um, from there, um, get into a glide path program where they can maintain their full-time job, but also uh, take classes on the side so they can move up into the healthcare uh, profession. So that's something that we're excited about. Thank you, Representative. Any any uh, other comments, Senator? No, I I, I also wanted to you know uh, thank our uh, education chair Kidani and uh, Vice Chair Donna Mercado Kim. She's also uh, Senator Kim is also the the Higher Education Committee chair. So um, uh, moving a lot of these a lot of the bills forward. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention. I'm not going to talk about it, but um, uh, if you have the time to look up SB two two five seven. Um, it's about CTE courses in Hawaii schools. Take a look at that one. It's a really uh, important bill that we've been trying to try, trying to move forward. Um, but I briefly wanted to mention um, SB three three two eight. Um, this this kind of clarifies a lot of this a lot of what we've been trying to do with the schools facilities authority. Um, so it it uh, it just replaces um, that with the office of facilities and real estate development. Um, and the Office of School Operations and Services. So, you know, recently with a lot of the lapses with the CIP funds in Department of Education, um, and, you know, a lot of our schools around the, the state have been needing a lot of these funds to, uh, you know, uh, keep, update, keep updated with um, how the facilities are taken care of. So this kind of streamlines uh, the, the execution of CIP projects um, and it further, assist DOE and Department of Education with fulfilling its mandate to provide, you know, high quality public education to always cakey. So look up that bill as well. It's again, SB 3328, um, something that we've been trying to move forward. If we have time for, uh, in this segment, for two quick things. One is, you know, on crime and public safety, uh, there was a lot of discussion on the firearms bill and gun safety. And you want to make a quick comment, either one of you or both of you on that? Yeah, so um, uh, very, very controversial. We want to make sure that, you know, the, 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 that um, we clarify a lot of the, the laws that Hawaii has with regards to what the Supreme Court has, has uh, mandated on the states. So um, we're trying to look at what's allowable, what's not allowable. You know, I have a very rural district. Um, on Hawaii Island that we have a lot of hunters mm. and, you know, a 50 caliber gun, you know, you use that um, uh, for hunting is, you know, you shoot a sheep with that thing, it's going to explode. So yeah. what, 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 what do, you know, how do we clarify what's allowable, what's not allowable, what, what can we pass on to the kids? Like, obviously we want better education um, to those that, that, yeah use firearms so that's just something that we wanted to clarify it is it is a controversial thing um the house is going to have to deal with it now i'm sorry nadine but um that's something that uh you know we we had a lot of debate about there there is also another bill the uh fireworks control law uh we wanted to just authorize law enforcement and fire officers to be able to enter and and inspect any licensee or permittees premises. Uh, there were issues about um, being able to safely destroy and dispose of e confiscated fireworks and requiring violators to be held liable for storage and disposal costs. So that's something that we want to improve upon. Um, we know there's some, some good progress being made and they just need time and resources to do a better job. You know, I think we are at the end of this segment, and Senator Kanua and Representative Nakamura, uh, the neighbor islands are well represented today, uh, from Big Island, Kauai, and Senator uh, McKelvey from Maui. But thank you very much. I appreciate the time that you spent, not only for uh, this program today, but in preparation uh, for the program. And I really appreciate that. So now we'll go to Senator uh, Angus McKelvey from Maui. And, you know, for many, many years, uh, 
Senator McKelvey was a member of the House of Representatives. And I think many of you know that uh, Senator McKelvey lives in Lahaina and was one of the individuals who lost his home. So I wanted to give uh, him some time to go into uh, some of the topics and including recovery timeline, but and the allocation of funds, but also some of the particular bills that pertain to the uh, uh, Maui wildfire. And, you know, like uh, residential rental uh, bills, et cetera. But Senator, you're on. You know, thanks for having me. You know, first off, Bob, I want to say that, you know, I actually, in comparison to my community, fared pretty well insofar as being come out of the fires. There's so many people, families in particular, that lost everything across the board. And, you know, many people in West Maui, we had an affordable housing situation that was in crisis mode anyway. High zip code, no affordable housing, which put constraint on our transportation system. And now all of a sudden, this has been exasperated beyond belief. Um, right now. And so we need to accelerate the affordable housing that was needed before the fire. And now it's having an impact on there. But many people, most of, you know, part of the conversation, all these have been, you know, driven by many people, many voices. But, you know, there's been a concern that, you know, particular, a few voices, you know, those are people who are homeowners whose houses have survived the fire. Uh, their voices are more, becoming more predominant. And those of uh, of uh, people, particularly the renters, of which 75% of the remaining people of whom support is being extended, uh, are not being included in the equation. I think this is why the absolute determination to have a granular, meticulous housing plan that tracks literally the individuals down to the units in the different stages is critical uh, from all stages of government. But I, mean, I think that, you know, these. These issues hit for me personally because I'm in the middle of it and I see and, you know, rub elbows with the affected victims every day. And so that's why I understand we need to be super aggressive on accountability, on numbers and results, not only fiscally, but it's about the, the human end and the family. You know, they're left twisting in the wind, they're left caught up in the wash and everything gets delayed. And with every phase slowing down and becoming delayed, it exponentially the costs increase. And getting West Maui, which is 15% of the GDP of the entire state, back up and running becomes delayed. Uh, so those are the issues. You know, I see it personally every day. I know the frustration of many survivors is akin to that that I see in the legislature. But I think right now, what I think the biggest thing that is occurring that has been occurring still is the inability of government to not only coordinate amongst themselves, but to actually get into the community to the survivor base and not everybody at large, because that's where the real intel, the real effectiveness of programs, the real, you know, whether bills, you know, whether well-intentioned or not are going to work, it's upon them. They're the user group that hopefully will be listened to, because that way the relief and response and the timelines can be tailored to those who are actually trying to be assisted. You know, there was a question, uh, Senator, that came up. Uh, I'll just, and, you know, I know that you're well aware of the situation, but the question was that, or, or the comment was that the fact that uh, rentals, and I'll, I'll read it here, in Lahaina, people are seeing rents for three-bedroom homes in upwards of 9000 a month. Yep. Uh, and whether this is... Accurate? I have no idea. But... It is absolutely accurate. And oh. it's being caused by the federal government. Um, a lot of what is going on, whether people need to understand, we're fronting all the money up front. And pie, pie crust promises, I call them, easily made, easily broken. And now they're being broken. And as a result, what was envisioned to be compensated or taken care of and covered is not. For instance, the COPA population. The federal government has a compact with the COPA migrant uh, nations and communities to compensate them for what you know they incurred you know over the years ago. And so FEMA and the federal government should be stepping front forward and helping us with the COPA populations directly um, instead of having it fall back upon the state. You know, and the federal government has come in with its housing brokers who have aggressively not only gone after as much inventory as they can, but they've also been offering those rates you just said. The housing market, rental market in Maui, 
Now West Mount, Maui is up 300%. And you know, you it's called FEMA fever has been the nickname. People are hearing about these high amounts that they can get property tax forgiven completely at the same time. And they're trying to get their properties. And meanwhile, because of this broker system, what happens is the broker pre-chooses a unit behind the scenes and then calls up a survivor and said, like the, kind of like the mob, this is what we got, take it or leave it. And so now what's happening is because many families, many businesses need to be in West Maui because the school don't have any cars burned up, um, they're being offered units on the other side of the island and that take it or leave it. You know? And the frustration with survivors is, again, boils down to two things. Lack of choice and lack of voice. And this is one of those areas that if there was a transparent open housing market for all the survivors, they could consciously choose their option and adjust to it. But right now what's happening, it's a one size fits all, take it or leave it. And this is what's generating not only the rental increases, but also the lack of mobility of getting people out of NCS into these residences. You know, by the way, I'll just mention a couple of bills uh, for the audience that you can always look up. There's a residential rentals bill, Senate Bill 2908. There's an emergency management bill, 2904. And uh, there's a bill on permanent housing that was introduced by Senator Hashimoto from Maui, which is Senate Bill 2836. So these are some of the bills that uh, the audience may want to look at in terms of uh, what the legislature is doing to help uh, uh, the Maui recovery. But uh, Senator, I know that you put in a bill uh, on charitable fundraising. You, can you expand on that uh, a little bit? Uh, yeah, it's to try to address the situation. You know, it's based off what California did, truth in giving. Uh, that many of the nonprofit entities will raise funds in the name of a disaster like the wildfire. Millions and upon hundreds of millions will be raised. And yet the story seems to be, at the end of the day, the end user, the survivors are like, <laughs> what? You know, I mean, there's no direct continuity to them. What happens is these giant nonprofits will seed other nonprofits that will conduct activities. And while beneficial, they go beyond the scope of the community, number one. And number two is it's not what the community needs. I, I think one of the more key points in, uh, is a threat is you really, in the end of the day, have a very small population of impacted people here, with, in which huge, huge resources are being put into, which begs the question, wouldn't we be better off just giving direct aid to the survivors themselves and cutting, cutting a definitive end to state support? Because that's what seems to be happening is you have all these programs and things going on. One of the good bills I want to touch upon, and that is uh, Senator Delacruz did, is a travel report bill to look at how much the states is spending on sending people over to Maui back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with the lodging and rental cars and, and costs and all of that, right? This is a kind of bleed out. So w when this comes back to this is that with the charitable giving, you have all of this money being raised. It's not getting into the impacted area. Housing, we need it there. We could use it for wraparound services for non-congregation. Then you have the revealing fact of foreign governments being directed to give donations to nonprofits. And so the, when that happens, with that kind of money being raised, the, the givers in the community need to see how it's being used, where it's being used, uh, and that the money is getting directed to help government and assisting individuals in their different situations. And right now, you know, a lot of this funding, to be honest with you, if it were be able to be directed into the pipeline, maybe the legislature could look at some special assessment just for disaster this disaster or something to pull the money down. Like housing, we could sure use that for wraparound services. We could sure use that to create a better housing solution that's now needed because we're so far behind the timeline right now. But also, it also the main thing is when you give money for a disaster, you want to know that your money's actually going to help your families. And when it doesn't happen, what people then turn to directed giving through, you know, some of these apps and, you know, that, and unfortunately what happens is disproportionate amount of benefits being given to certain people over a In a Senator, I, I, I someone asked the question whether uh, uh, some of the survivors there can access the private donations, but uh, my understanding, there's no system yet set up as to how 
people can access that. There's no, there's no, there's an, well, there's an also an unwillingness. I mean, one of the executives for one of the huge nonprofit fundraisers have basically advocated against giving direct aid, you know, from a from a benefactor, you know, argued against it, insinuating that the money would be wasted on things like clothes. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize kids grow, you know, and so, it, but again, it, somebody from one of the fires in the mainland. You know, told me in the very, very beginning, the state has such a unique corpus. Because remember, Lahaina was a thriving middle class community. Many of the people who are affected and displaced now, you know, although, yeah, it was challenging, they had many streams of income and were doing pretty well. So all of us all need to now look at them as homeless or that they're, a, you know, a, an income challenged population doesn't fit. What really could have happened is this again, the more autonomy you would have given it i think ppp would have been the best model you have accountability you have auditing and then what happens is in agreement for that you agree to not seek any more services from the state people can if this happened in the beginning people could have self-situated they could have done their own secured their own situation they could map out how they, they could have stayed in west maui instead of being to relocated out which is the case right now which comes at a cost to the economic recovery it comes at a cost to trying to get out of phase two and hopefully phase three. You know, Senator, maybe you won't, uh, I don't know if you can address this, but uh, is there any idea of what the timeline is for the recovery in Lahaina? I mean, both, uh, uh, you know, new housing, uh, temporary housing, uh, a better rental situation. It, uh, it's, what kind of timeline are we looking at? I'm being pessimistic. I'm going off of past disasters and the current track record of this one. And again, the, uh, the voluntary, you know, the relocation out of West Maui of people, you know, um, is coming at, an, that is one of the impacts it's coming at. But this is why we really, really need to stress, and that's why you know, the WAM Ways and Means Committee tried to do it, this granular housing plan, how many units for how many families, which bucket will it address? And, you know, will it be a something that they will actually buy into? And will it help? I think one of the immediate reclaim areas is within Lahaina Town itself. You have condominiums, Front Street Apartments, for instance. If the county and the four can coordinate with the state to clear that area, they're ready to move to rebuild those units that, and add more, which could be potentially 400 units coming online. We have, of course, the Kiabi Street Apartments up there by Kiabi Street. Uh, the developer there is interested in continuing to build out. And so we need to encourage that. But we also need to say, OK, this amount of units will be done. It'll be ready by this date. It's going to cost this amount of money. And these are the people who will be eligible to do it, whether it's DHS or we're going to work with FEMA. And if FEMA can hopefully start to join the state and the county in trying to develop a solution that allows us to create this housing, we can get more of this online within Lahaina um, quicker. But this is why we need that granular housing strategy for the rental market as well as, you know, for those who are displaced and their homes due to underinsurance, and that's a whole other topic, uh, that is also going to delay the recovery and the rebuild. So there's a lot of factors working against us, but I think having that granular strategy by all the entities that are being charged with this is critical to making sure we can keep to some sort of a timeline. Well, well, what about the uh, uh, cost of the infrastructure, rebuilding the infrastructure? And someone had told me, Senator, and I don't know how accurate this is, that it's going to be very difficult to rebuild on the existing uh, area that was devastated especially right off Front Street. And because of climate change, they're looking at different things, um, whether they have to move further north, uh, uh, north of Lahaina Town to rebuild. And I don't know how accurate that statement was. Well, I think that was, in, I think that could have been, a, uh, you know, I'm just assessing based on what you said, a convoluted, uh, the, the economic development of the county, I thought was a pretty good idea, was looking at one point of creating a, a you know a temporary front street, if you will, of the shops that were there up between the two timeshares on North Beach and that vacant area right there. Um, it didn't happen for, um, for what I can assume uh, very many as reasons. But the point you bring up, Bob, is an important one. This is an issue um, that I've been talking talk to people in the community on both the business side, the residents and others. This is a battle that has to happen now is what will be the future of Front Street. To your point, 
many of the areas that were there were grandfathered in, and now they're gone, they're within the inundation zone. And you have questions of whether they could even get national flood insurance anymore because they're in an inundation zone, right? And there's the issue of, will the state and the county now adhere to those setbacks and therefore, thereby initiate condemnation? If that happens, obviously, it'll be a very different front street. There are ways to be able to bring back, I think, some of those, you know, what was there before in a way that's harmonious with both planning, uh, insurance uh, protocols, and other things. But it's going to be a very, I'll be honest with you, an emotional and tough conversation because there's a good chunk of the community that would like to see that preserved and protected in some sort of an open space, each community, cultural type of open mark, you know, type of atmosphere. and. Um, uh, as well. So, but this is, th these are the conversations that need to happen. And I think that a lot of what is occurring is on the county level, but there is a desire to community, I think, to try to see if there's any way they can get more empowerment in these critical decisions. But they're critical decisions of climate change inundation versus, you know, what was Lahaina Front Street and part of the history, because before there was chemos, et cetera. Many of these places were owned by our, our Japanese American families and used as fishing markets. Yeah, and you, you know, didn't you put in a bill, if I recall, uh, I can't remember the, the title of it, uh, Senator Lahaina something, uh, to look at uh, whether you establish some kind of uh, task force or uh, organization to look at uh, rebuilding the cultural aspects of uh, Lahaina? Yeah, it was, no, really, that was a more of a, you know, a, I guess a conversation and self-determination. Oh. It's come up every 20 years. I don't think this generation, next generation has had this conversation. I was a staffer when it happened last time in the state Senate. I'll end up when there was a, an instrument floated to create a township of Lahaina, and it stemmed from the very same issues that Lahaina feels like it gives, you know, so much to this Maui County and Honolulu, and all the decisions and resources are taken and done there, and same with the disaster. Decisions being made, especially in these critical things like Front Street, like setbacks, like are being done and can be done currently in Wailuku, in Honolulu, in Washington, D.C. So the idea is possibly could you use a community development authority to create a community authority that would give the community through nine people that are elected the kind of ability to control the vision, the zoning, the rebuild, so create a more harmonious Lahaina where you have a vision-based zoning and not ad hoc-based zoning. But it's very contentious. There are a lot of side effects to it. It's a discussion in democracy. I've gotten a lot of fan mail from it, but you know, at the same time, I respect all that. Those, op those concerns and things are legitimate. But it's an exciting conversation to have, and no matter how it turns out, the fact that we had it is good. And you know, like I said, it's been about 20 years since we've had this. And every 20 years, West Maui government officials launch this conversation. And I wouldn't be surprised if Molokai people are like, hey, you know what? We could use one of those. <laughs> uh, Senator, thank you very much. Any last comments before we move to the homelessness uh, issue? Uh, no, I just want to say again to really stress that you know the people of Lahaina were industrious, hardworking local families that, but for the disaster, would still be doing so. They're not. A, they're not. A, they're not a pop destitute population with a hand that's out. It's a, asking for a hand up, and, and getting concrete answers and timelines basically not only makes a sense. But Lahaina doesn't want to bring the rest of the state down because of unending spending. But at the same time, having a very concrete, detailed plan, not only is fiscally responsible to everybody out there, but it's also most responsible to survivors who want to be able to chart a way forward. As one of them said, and I'll end with this, we haven't, haven't even had a chance to try. Thank you. Senator, thank you for taking the time to uh, address the audience and uh, good luck moving forward. Okay, we, we'd now like to move to the last segment of the uh, seminar this morning. And uh, we decided to focus on homelessness, which is a huge issue in the state. And uh, Representative Della Albalati is the chair of uh, the Health and Homelessness Committee in the House. So, uh, 
Representative, this has been a major issue for uh, many, many years. So what type of legislation has been considered? And uh, uh, if you can elaborate uh, on that, you know, because I know there were bills with regard to funding and treatment. So I'll let you uh, um, educate the people on the, on the webinar. Thank you. I want to thank First Think Tech Hawaii and your over 180 participants who are still hanging in there. Uh, yes, we have passed many bills. Uh, homelessness continues to remain a, a hot topic. Uh, it feels like we've been in a homeless situation emergency for the last 10 years or under some kind of emergency proclamation for, for a long time. So yes, we pa have passed some bills in the areas of funding, treatment, and prevention. Um, I really want to thank Bob for you setting the context about the budget and the conversations uh, about the budget, because I'm going to frame my, uh, my comments about bills in the context of some of the things that we have to consider in the budget. So one of the main priorities for the House has been increasing the base budget for homeless programs offices. These are for programs that do basic outreach, care coordination, when you see an individual on the street, under a bridge, a constituent calls to get help, our offices are often calling Department of uh, Human Services to, to do the outreach and, and to reach these people. Um, funding in, for that line item has not been increased for over a decade. For over a decade when we've been struggling with homelessness um, for, for that long. And so the House has made the position of increasing and boosting that, that budget item uh, by, by 5% to 20%. Now, the governor in his proposed budget also uh, increased, uh, uh, suggested that boost. So we're really just tracking what the governor wants. But now with the conversations about um, you know, budget concerns, now that we're looking at possible budget cuts uh, from the Senate being proposed or, or looked at, and understandably so, given our economic situation, it's going to be these kinds of um, measures that, and line items that we're going to need to track very carefully. So that's something to look for both in the budget negotiations, as well as in bills such as House Bill 1834, which is our vehicle in the House for that line item. Another example of, of budgeting and, and funding that's really critical, and it may not seem related, is um, requests from the department, uh, particularly the Department of Health, uh, AMHD, Adult Mental Health Division, for quality improvements uh, for the state hospital, as well as program improvements for community-based treatment. Now, the governor yesterday delivered his um, uh, supplemental message, governor's message number five to the legislature. And what we're seeing is um, a, a lot of requests across um, departments. And we've seen, um, I believe, over 14 million, maybe 10 million requests um, from the Department of Health to address many of the things that are happening at the state hospital in light of the recent tragedy that we saw happen. We need to improve the security um, uh, of the campus. We need to uh, uh, improve the staffing of the campus, but we also have to make sure we're funding both inpatient residential treatment in the hospital, as well as community-based treatment outside, because that will relieve um, the census in, in the hospital. And I raise this as an important issue for two reasons. One, you know, we know that there is an uh, intersection between homelessness, incarceration, mental health. And so this is a really important safety net area we need to fund if we're going to address the homelessness problem. I also raise this because in the bill that's moving from the state house uh, is House Bill 1941 that's looking to fund and it makes the recommendation to fund many of these uh, requests that are coming from the department from um, a special fund. In particular, it's the, um, let's see, it's a, it's a special fund uh, for mental health services. Now, I, I raise that because one of the things that I appreciate that the Senate is doing and that um, I believe uh, Senator Dela Cruz has done is really ask the department, look at all of your budget, look in total at your special funds, look at where you might be able to, to sustain cuts, look at, at all of your federal funds as well. And so I think when we scrub the budget, we need to ask ourselves, where can we find funding so we don't necessarily need to tap 
cash revenues. So for example, in this special fund that um, uh, Department of Health has access to and for which they've previously paid for these types of requests that they're asking for, I believe there's about nine to 10 million unencumbered um, as, as of the last time I checked with the Department uh, of Budget and Finance. And so there are places within all of our departments, special funds that we need to look at very carefully, uh, as well as do the due diligence, which I believe the Senate is engaged in in asking what is the plan from the governor to address the wildfires recovery. And one last um, uh, funding uh, bill for your um, folks to track is House Bill um, 2884. This is a vacated homeless encampment task force bill that comes from my uh, colleague, Representative Lachika. One of the things that we've learned over the last decade or so is that so much of what we need to do with homelessness is interdepartmental. So this is a smaller bill with a smaller subsidy that's really um, looking to fund and, and encourage the Department of, Ta of Transportation to continue in with its intergovernmental work when they, and, and, and it's because the Department of Transportation has so many lands where we see so many homeless encampments pop up. We were asking in that bill for the Department of Transportation to really engage in uh, interdepartmental task force, working with um, not just the county agencies that are important, but also the um, uh, federal agencies such as uh, um, the US Army, because we see federal lands also where there's a lot of encampments and we really want to encourage that coordination so that as these hotspots develop, we can be responsive to government. So Bob, that's just those are just three bills related to funding that all address homelessness. You know, Rep. Pilati, I have a question. Uh, uh, you've been health chair for several years, you know, throughout the years, and the homelessness chair for at least the last two, uh, two years. Uh, do you feel that, um, and, and homelessness still persists and whether it's growing, do you feel funding is one of the lack of funding, or if I want to say fund, the funding aspect, is that a major reason why uh, we can't get grips on this uh, situation? I think we are a part, we are at a point in time that funding is becoming critical because we have failed to keep up with the p uh, pace of inflation. And so the people that we're asking to really engage in the difficult work of transitioning folks moving folks from homelessness to supportive housing, we need to fund that critical safety net feature in our system. You know, there's a lot of people in the community through the true cost coalitions. Government relies on social service contractors to do much of the work with homelessness. homelessness. So, you know, uh, last year, when we were looking at like, you know, huge budget surpluses, there was a conversation going on and continuing to go on about what is the true cost of all of these services. So to answer your question, Bob, yes, funding at this point in time has become critical. We have seen the point in time uh, count only increase. And so we have to make a commitment. And that's why in these budget negotiations, it's going to be critical that we commit to protecting the social safety net. It's these social service programs that are helping us just manage homelessness at this point in time. If we wanna do more, we're gonna to have to look at boosting uh, these services. You know, with uh, listening to uh, the two majority leaders and talking about the economy and the impact of the Maui disaster, uh, funding is just gonna get tighter and tighter. And that becomes a, a larger problem for the homeless uh, programs and and uh, issue. And you know, part of the homelessness issue too, Representative, is the fact that you also need to fund more mental health treatment, and, and that's part of the whole situation. And uh, I don't know what percentage of the homeless individuals need. Uh, mental health treatment, but that's another, I think, big concern. Well, let me let me comment on that, Bob. And like you know, I think it's important that we can do uh, more than one thing in the legislature. We can focus on more than one priority. So I really think that you know, homelessness afflicts all counties. And let me talk about some other bills 
that you know require only strategic investments, um, and, and that will make a difference. Yesterday in Evil A, there was a a, a, a tremendous um, a milestone that was reached. Um, the governor and the city and county of Honolulu opened up their first behavioral health crisis center in the state. This is going to be a place where we do provide more mental health treatment um, for folks who are experiencing behavioral health crisis um, crises, many of them who may be within the homeless, houseless population. And so this is a, a collaboration. It was a whole of government approach. Uh, it involved the judiciary, who in 2019 began to, to discuss what did we need to do with our entire continuum of care for mental health, from mental health to the state hospital, right? From mental health, uh, folks experiencing mental health crisis who are going to the ERs and then um, uh, maybe not finding real help and then and advancing to a place where they're, where we find them in the state hospital. Well, there is a bill moving, House Bill uh, 1831, uh, and there's a sim similar bill, House Bill uh, 2309, as well as Senate Companions for um, these, these, these places, these hubs where folks can get treatment um, not necessarily in the ER, but they can receive treatment and maybe they just need 24 hour stabilization. And then they, they might need um, a, a 10 day stay at um, uh, for further stabilization. And then we can transition them to more supportive housing. So House Bill 1831 uh, with Behavioral Health Crisis Centers looks at a strategic investment um, in uh, for the next two years that's, that's under, nine, uh, under $10 million for two pilot programs that could continue to fund what was just open in Evil A, as well as another behavioral health crisis center on another island. Um, the homeless triage center is detox facilities that are needed. We know that on Hawaii Island, um, through the use of their opioid settlement funds, that Hawaii Island is opening up a detox center. And again, we know the intersection between substance abuse, mental health issues, and home homelessness. So these are all strategic investments that we need to make. And, and so I, I really encourage um, your um, participants to follow these bills about homeless triage centers, the behavioral health crisis centers, um, so that so that we, we can you know, really find the priorities uh, that we have to fund, the gaps we have to fund, and strategically um, invest in those areas. You know, Representative, let's hope that some of what the bills that you're mentioning and the Senate companions and other Senate bills uh, um, pass at the end of uh, the session this year. And, you know, there, I said at the beginning, there are about 750 bills, uh, House and Senate, that are still on the table. And uh, usually at the end of session, there are less than 300 bills that actually uh, pass the legislature. Uh, but if some of your, some of not your, but some of the homeless bills pass, do you feel it'll make a dent in, uh, the homeless situation? I do believe it will, Bob, you know, in addition to some of these funding bills that we've discussed, we also have bills that just look at, uh, policy reform changes that don't cost money. So for example, from our near from our new homelessness coordinator, um, John Mizuno, my former colleague who is now the coordinator on home, homelessness, he uh, uh, asked us and we're moving a bill that creatively looks at um, um, uh, community care foster homes being able to house an additional Medicaid individual who is facing housing instability. Now that doesn't cost anything to the state, um, uh, because what it's doing is it's just making sure that we have uh, treatment beds, spaces along the continuum of care for folks who are either at risk uh, for uh, homelessness or, or facing home housing instability. So yes, in addition to the funding bills we have, we have also policy reform changes that will not um, uh, uh, you know, increase the budget, but really will help us be able to move folks to the various places uh, where they need to go to to get help so that they're not simply languishing on the streets. Now, I assume that you feel that uh, providing shelter of some sort uh, is as important as mental health treatment. 
Yes, and it's that kind of, so the homeless programs um, budget line that I talked to you previously about, that that is 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 uh, the funding that also helps um, fund our, our, just the immediate shelters that some folks need. Uh, Representative, any last comments before we uh, end the seminar this morning? No, Bob, I just want to thank you and thank Think Tech again and all of your participants. I think it's really important to be engaged, to understand what bills are moving, how these bills interact with the budget, and really like, you know, holding um, us, your, your um, elected officials accountable to make sure that priorities for all of the state um, are addressed in this legislative session. Thank you very much, Representative. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the uh, members that have participated uh, 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 as registrations uh, increase over the last few days. And uh, I would like to thank all of the panel members, Senator Kanua, Representative Nakamura, Senator McKelvey, and of course, uh, Representative Bilotti, uh, who ended it with uh, the homelessness uh, issue. Um, the, there will be video replays over the next two Fridays, uh, at ThinkTech, and I think that it, uh, the replay will also be on, on YouTube. Uh, I would appreciate if the people that have signed up for this webinar can fill out the brief questionnaire to give us an idea of what type of areas you might be interested in for uh, future legislative seminars. Again, thank you very much for participating. And uh, my thanks again to all the panelists who spent a lot of time in preparing for this seminar. Thank you very much and a mahalo to ThinkTech for uh, helping to produce this uh, seminar. Thank you.